Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for being here. As you know, expanding access to child care has been a top priority since my very first day in office. Six years ago, back in 2017, I started talking a lot about what I called a cradle-to-career vision for education in Vermont, where we focus more on early care and learning, as well as higher education and trades training. Back then, I proposed increasing child care subsidies by $7.5 million every year, which at the, same, at the time was a pretty big deal. So with that in mind, I just want to remind everyone how far we've come. While $7.5 million was a lot of money back then, the legislature actually cut it down to $2.5 million. But we kept pushing, and were able to chip away and dedicate more and more each year. To the point that in my first six years as governor, we doubled our investments in child care subsidies, which was significant. It's also important to remember the plan I put forward in 2018 that would have dedicated online sales tax as a result of the Wayfair decision for child care, which now generates tens of millions of dollars each year. For reference, it was $62 million in fiscal year 22. Unfortunately, that too was rejected by the legislature. But since then, the legislature has come around and agrees this must be a priority, which is encouraging. As you've heard me say many times, we share similar goals and priorities, but where we differ is how we pay for it and the speed in which we get there. Last year, we expanded child care subsidies to 350% of the federal poverty limit or poverty level. To put that in perspective, a four-person household at 350% of FPL equates to about $105,000 each year. Knowing we all wanted to go big on childcare this year, I propose using $56 million in organic, ongoing base revenue growth to bring the subsidy up to 400% of the federal poverty level, which would have made us tied for the most generous state in the nation tied for number one. That would mean middle class families with household incomes up to 120,000 a year would have access to support, helping about 4,000 more kids than we help today. When the Senate House appeared to be at a stalemate in May on child care, my team approached legislative leadership about a path to get to 450% of FPL with a 10% rate increase without relying on new and regressive taxes. But there was no apparent interest. Instead, they seemed determined to raise a new tax, any tax, so they ended up with a regressive payroll tax. Their plan would help households making up to $172,000 per year, which is 575% of that PL. So if you're a lower income Vermonter, already receiving free child care, under their plan, you would have to pay a tax so that more affluent families get support with no added benefit to you. Vermont is already one of the highest tax and least competitive states in the nation. The last thing we should be doing is making it worse. Proponents of raising taxes and fees will always point to the amount raised in silos, trying to say, it's not actually that much. But what type of thinking, but that type of thinking adds up year after year, and it's what's made Vermont one of the highest tax states in the nation. Even this session, I've sounded the alarm about the cumulative impact of all the new fees, taxes, and penalties that were discussed. That's why I felt as though I had no choice but to veto their regressive tax plan. I want to be very clear. <clears throat> I know some headlines will probably read, Scott vetoes child care. But I'm not vetoing child care. I'm vetoing the payroll tax. As we've already discussed, no governor in state history has been as committed to funding child care. And I'm very proud of that record. I believe we can eventually get to where we all want to go, but we need to do it in a measured way to make sure it's sustainable. And what I proposed is sustainable. And if our economy weathers the economic storm clouds we're seeing, 
will be able to take additional steps in the future. I believe it's this type of reasonable approach Vermonters elected me to bring to the table, and I hope legislators will join me because we can care for our kids without making Vermont less affordable. So with that, I'll open up the questions. Governor, did I did you say that you will be or have vetoed S-56? The Senate talk here? I'm sorry? It's H-27. Yeah, it's, it's an H bill. Oh, okay. Yeah, but yes. Okay. Have you already or will you? Have you already or will you? Yeah. I have already signed the letter. We have not sent it to them. Okay. But you will. But it will be done in the next hour. You don't have the number of that bill? Sorry. It's 217. 217? Okay. Um, there was tripartisan support for this bill in the House. Um, I mean, quite a few Republican lawmakers came along understanding your concerns about the payroll tax. Um, was it a close call for you? I mean, was there part of you that thought, you know, maybe this is such an important issue that uh, this is a place where it's okay to raise Yeah, them? well, you know how I feel about child care. And uh, it's something that we've been working on for the last six years and been focusing a lot of attention on that. So yeah, it was, it was difficult. but. In my seat, you have to look at the cumulative impact of all the tax and fees that are being raised and look at the health, the economic health of the entire state. And this, um, this much in one year uh, gave me pause and uh, I decided that uh, this is uh, not the time to be raising this amount um, in, uh, in a payroll tax. Now, the payroll tax itself, especially when we have all the surpluses we have, and there was another way to get there. The payroll tax itself um, has been used uh, before in this way, and it opens the door for a lot more. It's, a, it's easy year after year. Once the door is open, I guarantee, uh, because it's just a little bit uh, out of everyone's pocket, that they'll be going back to the well time and time again. I imagine this is one of the <clears throat> bills that uh, once they receive your veto letter, once we come back for the veto session, this is going to be one of the ones that they'll be taking up, I'd imagine. Um, how will you make your, your argument to some of those lawmakers, as, as Peter said, were had that tripartisan uh, agreement on this bill so that you can potentially sustain that veto? Well, again, um, I'm just going to make the case like I'm making it today. Uh, it's the cumulative impact. There is another path forward. Uh, we can do it with organic growth. And, uh, and we can do it without impacting those uh, on the lower end of the economic scale. Like I said, this is a regressive tax, a flat tax. It affects everyone the same, um, but impacts, in some respects, those on the lower end much, much greater uh, because it's, uh, it's the same tax, whether you make um, 50000 or you make 500000 um, Well, would you have supported the income tax more? Which well, again, I would have taken a look at that, um, but, um, but I do believe in a measured approach, uh, something, again, that we've worked on for the last six years and it's worked out pretty well. Again, as a reminder, and I said it in my remarks, uh, but if, if we had gone with a proposal that I put forward, the $56 million out of organic growth, out of existing resources, uh, we would have been tied for number one in the nation in terms of generosity. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty bold statement. And we can get further um, if we continue to pay attention to our economy. Uh, we'll grow that organic growth and uh, be able to do more in the future. So I just think there's another path forward. Um, earlier you said, you know, if you're a lower income Vermonter, you know, who's below 150% of FPL, um, you know, this bill becomes law, you will be paying a new payroll tax. Um, but, you know, there'll be no added benefit because you're already getting free child care. But wouldn't that same family be benefiting from a child care center, for example, that's not in crisis, that's able to retain staff, that's, you know, from a sector that is itself more stable? Might they not be able to 
actually find a spot that doesn't exist right now because well, you're you're under the assumption that this will actually grow the number of child care centers. Mm -hmm. I I'd like to see that math. Mm -hmm. I know that we're going to be increasing rates, but I'm I'm not sure it's going to be increasing capacity. So if you could or somebody can show me that, that would be interesting. Um, I mean, I've heard it framed more as a child care stabilization initiative um, that we're going to see huge numbers of child care centers, home and community-based, um, go insolvent if there isn't some rapid infusion of substantial dollars. Into that. Well, $56 million used to be a lot of money, and that's what we were proposing. So, I, I mean, I, I just think there was another way to do it. I, we were proposing a major, major impact. Again, going back to the Wayfair decision, right? Uh, we asked the legislature to go along with us uh, to dedicate that funding uh, to, uh, to child care. And uh, they said, no, oh, it's just not enough. It was probably, what, three or four million or something like that in the first year. But it's grown to 62 million now. Had we taken advantage of that, coupled with the 56 million, we wouldn't be talking about any taxes right now. So, again, I think that... I mean, I don't think, I don't recall them saying it's not enough. I recall them saying it's a rate on the education fund because it's a sales tax, and that. Well, it wasn't. A, it wasn't dedicated to that at that point in time. It was a well, new, a new that. tax. It was. It was a new provision. Yeah. So, it would have been easy. We've had surpluses since. So I, I, you know, I just think that we squandered an opportunity there. I gather from statements that you've made in the past that relate to child care, that you view the $56 million in your budget proposal as an investment, an investment that was going to yield returns, economic benefits to the state by virtue of you know, pa young parents having access to child care. Um, why not view this legislative package in the same terms, that child care is a thing that is going to have economic dividends, um, down the line that we're going to get more dollars and we put in for it. Uh, well, because with our proposal, we didn't have to take a loan to do it. We weren't making mortgage payments. That's basically what we're doing now. We're asking Vermonters uh, to make payments on this, mortgage payments, to pay for it. We did it with existing revenue, and it makes a huge difference. Do you plan on campaigning for a sustained vote? I mean, are you going to be are you going to be working this? We are going to be working. Anything we vetoed, uh, we'll be making our case. You know, I, I mean, I don't know about campaigning. We're not going to be taking out any ads or anything of that nature. Uh, but we are. We're going to make our case. To who? I mean, are you going to be calling in individual lawmakers? Well, what's that going to look like? Again, we're, we're going to be doing it in the court of public opinion, I think. I think that's the only hope we have. Uh, they obviously, I mean, I've said this last, last week, um, they obviously have the supermajority. They have the power. Uh, they've proven that they can override uh, any of my vetoes. Uh, they just have to hold people together. And, and as I said last week uh, with the with a budget, um, the likelihood of, uh, of them sustaining my veto is uh, pretty slim. I think everyone will put, will come home uh, eventually, and uh, they'll put politics and party ahead of, uh, of doing the right thing. Why uh, wait until 3 o'clock this afternoon to announce your decision? Why not one? Um, weren't ready. Um, I mean, it, it's, there's a lot going on. There's a number of bills we have to go through. Uh, we have until midnight tonight. Um, we thought we were doing a favor by having it early. Uh, I didn't think you wanted to come in at 11. Uh, so we, uh, and we have, you know, the veto letter have to, has to be crafted. I mean, there's, there's things that have to be done. We want to do it in a, in a measured way. So there's no, there's no strategy behind it. 
the mayor of Burlington yesterday has said that he's prevailing on you and your administration to um, partially extend hotel housing for some of the most vulnerable folks. Um, they say if you can keep them where they are until February, they will find shelter for those folks after that. We've been, we've been hearing that month after month after month after month so after month. This is the latest plea, um, your, your response to the, to the city's request. Yeah, I, I, again, we will, we will take that into consideration, but, uh, but I've, we have to end it sometime. And um, I know their other proposal they've been asking, uh, they asked about the uh, Cherry Street uh, building. Uh, they have the right of first refusal on that building. Uh, so if they want to buy it, um, they are welcome to do so. I mean, there's a provision in the capital bill for that, if and when we get that uh, to my desk and sign it. Um, any updates from you or your cabinet on how things are going from where you sit? I might ask the experts if you want to give them an update on what you're hearing and seeing. So as folks know, we exited um, out of the general assistance program around just a little less than 800, 800 individuals. Um, I have to say that I'm really proud of the state employees who for months have been working with individuals to help them design and develop plans and for the service providers that the agency works really closely with. Um, we recognize that this transition is really hard for many Vermonters and I want to acknowledge that. Um, but what we're seeing on the ground is that the majority of the individuals have had a plan, they've moved forward with a service provider, um, and this mirrors what we've seen in the past for the end of our adverse, ch our adverse weather conditions um, policy. Um, and so we're not seeing a lot of pressures on um, the downtowns or um, a lot of cri crisis in mental health. And so, um, so far, um, while we recognize the impact it has on individuals, um, we feel like the transition has gone relatively smoothly. Uh, when you say that a majority of the heads in plan, um, where does that come from? Is that like data that you're collecting? We've, we've been monitoring the distal impacts. Um, what are we seeing in our communities? Um, and we're not, and we haven't seen the pressures that many folks anticipated or expected. Um, when we've talked with and uh, worked with clients that we've been working with for months, um, they have been able to find alternative options. Those have ranged from um, paying for hotel rooms to extend them stays because they work, um, to moving back to their home communities. Um, so there, there have been a variety of different options that we've that we've seen that folks have exercised right but is that just like a feeling or is there like a are there, are there numbers like you know 25 percent are in shelters 10 percent are in nursing homes etc again this is an economic services program the ga program um, and so when individuals leave the program um, we don't have a way they're they're individuals um, we've been paying for their hotel rooms um, and we don't have a mechanism to fully track, but we watch what's happening in shelters, emergency departments, public safety, um, and so far, um, this has been a relatively smooth transition. I'm not sure, Governor, if you want to add anything. Um, I think uh, Secretary Samuelson has pointed out uh, numerous times over the last couple of days uh, that her team is ready, willing, and able to help anyone uh, who is finding themselves without a plan, without a place to go, and we have services uh, that we can help uh, point them in the right direction, help them out, uh, and we're eager to do that. So if anyone knows someone uh, in, this, uh, in this situation, please reach out. Um, I don't know which department they should reach out to. Department for Children and Families and Department. So the Department for Children and Families um, has a website. It's established and it's set, and it's set up. And it, if you see something, we definitely want to know about it. We're there to help and support folks. And so you can find contact information there. And we're definitely out there to support um, the clients of the agency. Governor, uh, Governor Sununu uh, said that he is not seeking the presidential uh, the, the GOP nomination for, for the primaries. Uh, what, what do you make of this this news, and, and what what do you 
who do you see, I guess, as sort of that middle lane sort of moderate, if you will? Um, I don't know about the middle lane uh, moderate, but, um, but I'm not surprised that he uh, decided not to run. Um, but, um, but it was his decision to make. Uh, I think, um, I think uh, former uh, Governor Christie will make life very interesting uh, during the primaries. Uh, so stay tuned there. I think he will be a bit of a rabble rouser. What do, what do you mean interesting? Uh, he's just very quick-witted. Um, he's, he will have a lot to say, and um, it, it, should be, it should be an interesting campaign. You expect him to challenge President Trump I, on some I do. issues? I do. So Chris Christie, somebody you're keeping an open mind about? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I'll keep an open mind uh, about uh, Governor Christie. He, um, he was someone I got to know uh, back before I became governor. He came here to speak, uh, as you might remember, uh, to the Vermont GOP. We, were, we weren't allowed in. Oh, you weren't. That's right. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, you could have paid, right? No, no, we were, we were barred. Oh, you were. Uh, Sorry to hear that. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll see if you'll come back and give an encore. Um, but, um, but he was interesting. Again, um, he's a wealth of knowledge and has a lot of opinions. What do you think of Governor DeSantis? Um, he. Uh, Again, I don't think anyone was surprised when he made his announcement. Uh, I don't know him all that well. I don't think I've even ever formally met him. So, uh, so I don't know him as well as some of the others. I know Asa Hutchinson. Um, I guess uh, Governor Burgum is uh, talking about entering the race as well. Uh, again, uh, very, very uh, a good governor uh, in North Dakota and uh, wealth of knowledge in the energy sector in particular, and uh, came from the IT sector. So he, um, he again, is a, just a, a good person, and uh, well, it'd be interesting to watch him as he goes through the race. Could you contemplate supporting Governor DeSantis? Um, we'll see how this all plays out. You know, it's, we got a long ways to go. Governor, this is a different child care problem. Uh, some out-of-state car drug cartels are using juveniles in their Vermont drug trafficking operations. Our schools are sounding the alarm about violence and mental illness. And just, I, I think maybe we could be seeing a, a potential spike in juvenile violent crime. Uh, are we any closer to a secure facility? And also, picking up on something that Secretary Samuelson said at a recent press conference, are, are state workers now watching potentially dangerous juvenile offenders in hotel rooms and in their own homes? Well, again, um, part, of, part of what we we're seeing in the hotel motel program um, gave us pause because we didn't have eyes on them. We couldn't provide the services they needed. And uh, so one of the benefits of uh, moving away from that program is uh, they will be able to see some of the problems, hopefully, uh, before they come to fruition. Uh, in terms of uh, using uh, young adults uh, for as mules, so to speak, uh, bringing drugs into the state, yeah, we've, we're fully aware of that. And it's one of the reasons why uh, we, uh, we fought against the uh, raising the age uh, in, in judiciary, uh, because, um, because we're known uh, to drug traffickers as a state uh, that is lenient uh, towards the youth, and um, they really don't face any repercussions as a result. So um, they, they really um, use them to benefit their, their drug trafficking. As far as state employees sort of personally watching juvenile, criminal, d dangerous juvenile offenders in their own homes or hotel rooms, is that? Secretary Yeah, so uh, we have been working very diligently, um, particularly around this issue. Uh, we ended um, months ago, I can't remember, it, it's a year, maybe even more as much as a year and a half ago, staffing juveniles in hotel rooms. 
Um, and as far as I know, we are not staffing them in individuals' homes either. Um, that would be against uh, the policies of the Department for Children and Families to staff them in their, in their homes. So, no, um, we do, the, the staff do um, staff juveniles who have had interactions with the court systems. Typically, some of the locations have been police departments. Um, there's a sheriff's office that we've um, staffed children and youth at, but no, the, we do not staff them in hotels or in their homes. Go to the phones, starting with, we can come back to the people in, in the room. Uh, Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Thanks, Jason. No questions today. Thank you very much. James? Uh, open primaries. I don't know if you still support open primaries, but as you may know, Dean Davis back in the late 60s thought it might encourage more participation if we didn't have just registered Republicans, registered Democrats in the party. Statistically, it didn't work out that way. The election in 2000, when Fred Tuttle was elected against Jack McMullen in the primary, the Democrats went over to elect him, which he promptly endorsed Pat Leahy. And in the recent election, uh, national election, the Democratic strategists picked out a number of states where they ran ads to encourage Democrats to vote against, vote for the weakest Republican. And they won six cases, which caused the blue wave, the red wave not to happen. Do you think we should go back to Republicans nominating Republicans and Democrats nominating Democrats or just free for all? Um, I think if you have a contested primary on either side, it draws people in. I think what we have right now is working, um, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, I'm not sure that I would have made it through a primary or two uh, had it been a closed primary. <laughs> okay. Uh, Governor, you signed S-100 yesterday. Um, just from a, a macro lens, macro level, how do you view this bill in terms of, is this the first stepping stone, the first roadblock that was kicked down for real reform, or do you think this law as constituted will actually make a real difference? Yeah, I think this will make a difference, but it's not real reform. Uh, we have a long ways to go in that regard, especially with Act 250. It's something that I have, I'm, I've been talking about for the last six or seven years. Uh, we need to modernize Act 250, uh, but this is uh, a step forward, and uh, I'll, I'll take anything we can get at this point in time. Uh, I don't know if you know if Vermont is sending any officials, any firefighters to Quebec to help with the, the fires? Yeah, we, um, we did reach out uh, to uh, the Canadian officials uh, in Nova Scotia and Quebec. Um, and they uh, told us what their needs were. We weren't able to fulfill those needs. Uh, we're fairly dry here, and we're, we're down on staff as well. So um, we'll keep in constant contact with them and do everything we can to support them uh, if it becomes uh, even, even worse. Uh, but, uh, but at this point, we weren't able to send, send anybody there. But we did reach out. Governor, I have a question. Getting back to the budget for a second, and maybe Commissioner Gresham can chime in, but in your, your veto letter, I believe, you said that this will potentially raise the average household cost per, per household about 1200 dollars a year. Uh, can you shed a little light on, on how your administration arrived at that number? Yeah, I mean, there's um, uh, Commissioner Gresham probably could do this better than I could, but uh, um, but we just equated the average Vermonter and, and took the, uh, the tax pressures fee uh, pressures and uh, add them up, and that's what we come up with. Um, but going out to the uh, affordable clean heat standard as well, uh, which is a couple of years out, so it's not immediate. So those, like the S5 costs, those would be, those would be big, in yeah. a couple of those, right. those those wouldn't be implemented for a few years. That's right, in a couple of years. Um, in my post-budget veto conversation with uh, Senator Phil Baruth, he um, talked about that $1,200 figure. And I can't remember exactly what he said, but you know, basically he was saying that's made up and fake. And the so what, is what does he come up with? Well, his argument was specifically because you were using the uh, 
this extrapolating from what you assume will happen um, to fuel costs if S5, well, S5 is law, but if lawmakers come back and actually do vote on it and then fuel dealers do increase their prices. I look forward to his, what he thinks the increase will be. I'm sure he agrees there's going to be an increase, right? He seemed to believe that fuel dealers would likely raise their costs. Right. So there will be a cost increase and in the cost pressures with all the other tax and fees that they're contemplating and the pass into law. I'm sure he must have a figure in mind, but uh, maybe you can ask him that. Well, I think he'd probably say, well, we ordered a study and we'll see what the actual figure is. Well, not just with S5. I'm talking about everything else because we, we took the cumulative impact. What is the cumulative impact without S5? I don't know. I we, I can we can get you that. Um, I mean, you talked a lot in recent weeks about serving as a check against Democratic supermajorities in the House and Senate. Um, are you that anymore? Um, well, not as effective as I'd like to be, obviously. Um, we'll see what happens at the end of June. Um, but, um, but it's getting more difficult. This has been one of the more difficult years. We, particularly with uh, less engagement with the legislature, uh, we were just a bit of a speed bump along the way uh, to their passing whatever they wanted to pass. How has that affected the way you view your job and this, your, your job satisfaction levels? <laughs> well, I don't, I don't keep track of that. Uh, but, uh, but I would say um, we continue to keep our head down, uh, plug along, do the best we can uh, to serve Vermonters. And, uh, and I'll continue uh, to, to veto bills that I don't think are, are good for the economic health of Vermont. And uh, regardless of you know, whether it's satisfying or not satisfying, and uh, I, I think uh, it's just the way we do business. So I just call them if we see them. Governor, uh, Auditor Doug Hopper says that the Agency of Digital Services you created is underperforming. Uh, do, you, do you agree with that? And what? As compared to the previous uh, Agency of Digital Services? Uh, I believe. Did, did you not create that? Yeah, we did. Yes. I was being, uh, I was being sarcastic. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, you know, I. This has been an incredible inflationary time, and I think some of the uh, biggest things we've seen throughout, whether it's in uh, VTRANS or buildings, general services, or agency of digital services, or in our own daily lives, going to the grocery store, um, the prices have gone up uh, incredibly in every sector. And um, digital services has uh, has uh, felt the impact as well. So I think that was the biggest criticism that he had. And uh, obviously, uh, anything uh, we can glean uh, from anything he uh, he produces uh, will work to get better. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.